All right, it's another exciting day in music theory. We are finally adding some new harmonies. We've spent the last week just with one and five and the five seven and inversions of them. We're finally adding a few new harmonies today. You're going to need your intro to predominant handout and a pencil. So grab those and we'll get started. This top little score snippet might look familiar to you. That is because we have looked at this chorale before. Uh, about two weeks ago when we first introduced Roman numeral analysis, we went through this chorale and we labeled all of the root position one and five chords because that is all we knew at the time. We know a little bit more now, so we can do a little bit more with this excerpt. So I've just got the first phrase here. Let's listen to it. Uh, to refresh our memories, I'm going to use that same string quartet that we listened to in class. Okay, now let's go through and put Roman numerals to the harmonies that we know already. So we're in F major. We've got our two root position tonics that start. I'll fill in what we did that first week with this piece, which was a couple of ones and a five. Now, since then, we've learned about inversions. And you'll notice that right here, we have an inversion of our tonic triad. That leaves two other harmonies. This one and this one that we have yet to analyze. Now let's take a look at both of them. This first one in yellow. Let's do what I call an inventory of the pitches. So you are going to just get a list of what notes are there in the harmony. So we've got a G that's in the bass, B flat in the tenor, E in the alto, and then another B-flat in the soprano. Now, let's put that into a triad. So let's rearrange those three letter names that we have to put them into a root position triad so we can figure out what Roman numeral this would get. So if I want to stack this in thirds then, E, G, B-flat would be my root position triad. Now we are in F major. Your next step is to figure out what scale degree the root is to determine its Roman numeral. So we're in F major. That means that E, which is the root, is scale degree 7. So that means our Roman numeral then would be some flavor of a 7. And if you remember from video 5, which seems like it was a million years ago, the quality of the seven chord in a major key, the quality of your seven triad, is a diminished triad. So it gets that little degree symbol. So here's what it sounds like in root position. We have it as the G being in the bass, and then an extra B flat on top. So since the G is in the bass, and the G is the third, that means that it is a first inversion seven chord. So we would give this the label seven diminished six. Okay, that's our first mystery chord. Now let's look at the second one. We're gonna do the same thing. Let's first work out what pitches we have. We've got B flat in the bass. We've got an F in the tenor, another B flat in the alto, and a D in the soprano. So let's turn this into a root position triad. Rearrange your pitches to have stacked thirds. That gives you B flat, D, F. Since we are in F major, B flat is which scale degree? So spell yourself up the scale. F, G, A, B flat, one, two, three, four. So scale degree four. And that means it will then get a flavor of a Roman numeral four. And again, if you need to refer back to video five and or its handout, 
the quality of a four chord in a major key is major. And B flat is in the bass, so it's in root position. We would label this with a four. Now let's take a look at what this first harmony is doing, the seven diminished six. If you look at it, it is sandwiched in between two tonic triads, right? We've got a root position tonic. And then a beat later, we have a first inversion tonic, or two beats later, sorry. So we go from root position to first inversion. And to kind of connect them in between, here's our root position triad. We connect it with that seven diminished six. And if you look at the bass, it's in this passing motion. Our bass line is one, two, three, with one and three being the tonic triad chords. And the chord built off of scale degree two in the middle is connecting them. Now we've seen this before, and that was when we were talking about inversions of the 5-7. If you remember, we often see one of the 5-7 inversions also acting as a connector chord between one, here's your inverted 5-7, and there's your 1-6. So we see the 5-4-3, which is the inversion of the 5-7 with scale degree 2 in the bass, acting as a passing chord to prolong tonic. Now we're seeing this 7 diminished 6 doing the same exact thing. What that highlights is the fact that the 7 diminished 6 is often used as a substitute for the 5 chord. Why might we do that? Let's take a look at the scale degrees that are involved in, let's say, a 5-7. So a 5-7 in scale degrees, 5, 5, 7, 2, and 4. Now let's look at a 7 chord. The root is scale degree 7, and if you stack thirds on top of it, you get 2 and four. So by looking at those two, they share three notes. The entire seven diminished triad is contained within a five seven. So the seven diminished six acts as a substitute for the five chord. The only thing it's missing is scale degree five. All the other members of the five seven are there. So for that reason, we see this 7 diminished 6 often as a stand-in for the 5 chord. We spent all this time on 1 and 5. There is actually a, another type of dominant. It, it is your 7 chord. And we see it in first inversion almost exclusively. Okay, let's talk about the other newish harmony. Um, and that is this 4 chord. The only thing I want to draw your attention to right now is where it occurs in terms of tonic and dominant. So it is coming after a tonic triad and before a dominant harmony. That's all I want you to think about for right now. Let's listen to some Beethoven and we're going to actually kind of compare both of these excerpts and how they are treating the newer harmonies to our vocabulary. So let's give this a listen. I know I have a lot of keyboardists here, so uh, some of you might already know this piece. So let's give it a listen and then we'll talk. <laughs> just doing a quick Roman numeral analysis. We'll start with the things that we know. So taking a look at the key signature and what your ears told you and the title of the piece. <laughs> we are in F minor. 
So how about you try this on your own? Put Roman numerals on any tonic and dominant chords and then come on back and see if we have the same answers. Okay, so this is your tonic and dominant stuff. We've got tonic triad and then we have a 5-6-5 five, five, which has the leading tone in the bass, right? That goes back to 1. So here's another nice tonic prolongation. So that 565 is acting as a lower neighbor chord. You've got one, five, six, five, one, your bass line. One, seven, one. Your bass line acting in that little lower neighbor fashion. And then from there on out, our bass line actually steadily climbs by step all the way up to five. We've got a one six stuck in there and a five at the end. Let's figure out what's happening in between. So let's look at the first measure of that second system. Take a little inventory of the notes. Let's just look at the left hand. That gives us everything we need. We have an E natural, G in the bass, we've got a B flat in the tenor. I'll play it for you if that helps. And if you want to find a Roman numeral for that, you can tell by the way it's written that the root is in the top of that voicing. So our root is the E natural, which in F is the leading tone. So if you remember from video five, you get two flavors of seven chords in the minor key. You get the seven chord built off of the natural minor seven, and you get the seven chord built off of the leading tone, and they are different qualities. This one, the seven chord built off the leading tone, is a diminished quality triad. So there is our seven diminished six. And again, it is in first inversion. And let's see how it's behaving. Again, it is connecting this one to the one six. So we've got a bass line of one, two, and three. So prolonging tonic once again. We are, you know, six measures into this and we haven't really left tonic. We've left it, but we haven't really left it. And then we get a new chord. Let's take a look at what we have going on here. So take a look at your left hand. We have B flat in the lowest voice, D, and then G. We'll take the G from the right hand. Where then do you think, what do you think would be an appropriate label for that? So you've got to again rearrange it to form a triad. So it gives us G, B flat, D flat. G is which scale degree in F minor? Scale degree two. So this is some flavor of a two chord then. What quality is a two chord in minor? It is actually also diminished. So here we have a two diminished six because it is in first inversion. Now we already saw how the 7-6 behaved, again as part of that prolongation. Let's see what this 2-6 is doing. And let's compare it to the Bach. So look where the 4 chord is in the Bach, right at the top of the screen. And here again, we have this 2-6 that comes after a tonic triad and before a dominant chord. So both the 4 chord and the 2-6 seem to be functioning in the same way. They are occurring at the same time in a sequence of harmonies. They're both occurring after tonic, but before the dominant. Which brings us to our topic then for the day, which is a new class of harmonies, which are called the predominant harmonies. You can probably tell by the name. Uh, they are the harmonies that occur pre or before the dominant is a class of harmonies that come before the dominant harmony in many progressions. Now the simplest type of progression we can have 
are the ones that we've been looking at. One, five, and one. But if we want to add a little flavor to it, the first step is usually to add some predominant harmonies. So we can get one something else, five, and one. And that something else is the predominant class. For right now, we are going to focus on three specific predominant harmonies. And they are two of them you've seen just now. So we have had the four and the two six. You can also have the two chord in root position in major keys only. So only in major keys, you can have the two just in regular root position. Now, that opens up a kind of new harmonic pathway then. So our tonic harmonies now, they can go to the dominant. So they can go to dominant harmonies. But now they can also go to predominant harmonies. And then just to remind you, the first thing we did today was actually include a new type of dominant harmony. And that is the 7-6, which acts as a substitute for the 5 or 5-7, five, and is also a dominant harmony. Now, predominant harmonies do not have the same ability as tonic does to go kind of anywhere. Predominant harmonies can go to the dominant. That's it. That's their job. Go to the dominant. But that means they cannot go to tonic. And in reversal, Dominant harmonies can go to tonic, which you already know from all of the 1-5-1 one, one progressions that we wrote. But they actually cannot go to the predominant. So they can only go to tonic. They can't go kind of backwards to the predominant. And we'll spend more time on this idea of the tonic predominant dominant syntax on Wednesday. But for now, what you need to know is tonic can go anywhere, predominant can go to the dominant, but not to tonic, and the dominant can go to tonic, but not the predominant. All right, let's do a little bit of part writing. I'm going to do the first one with you, so we'll do the first one together, and then I'll send you off on your own to do the second one and come back and check. B minor, one, two diminished six, five or five, seven, choose your own adventure, and then one. Let's go ahead and sketch out a bass line first. I'm going to use scale degrees below the staff, and then I will write letter names above the staff. So let's talk scale degrees first. We have our tonic triad, so I'm just going to leave that be. Our two, six. Scale degrees two, four, and six, with four being in the bass. Our five chord, five, seven, two, and maybe four, if you decide to have a five, seven. And then tonic triad one last time, one, three, and five. Let's sketch out a bass line. So B minor, scale degree four has to be in the bass for the two, six. So B, C sharp, D, E is scale degree four. That means F sharp is five, back down to B for one. All right, now let's talk uh, pitch names to finish spelling out the rest of the triad. So our two, six, C sharp, E, and G. Our five or five, seven, F sharp. A sharp, don't forget to raise your leading tone because we're in a minor key. C sharp, and then maybe E if you want it for the seventh. And then our tonic triad, B, D, and F sharp. All right, let's get to it. Looking at that first tonic triad, you might have already noticed that there are two thirds, which is pretty unusual. And I will show you in a second why um, why that's there and why you have to be careful with it. When you see those two D's and you've got a C sharp diminished triad coming up, it's probably really tempting to go, oh, I'm going to double the C sharp, cool, and move them both to C sharp. And that's going to give you 
fat parallel octaves between your tenor and your soprano. So instead of doing that, we are going to have to move one of those pitches to the C sharp because we do need a root, right? And we will move the other one to another note. So I'm going to go ahead and move my tenor down to the C sharp. And I will go ahead and move my soprano to the E and then take my alto up to the G. So now the base of my two six is doubled, which is fine. And we have a nice complete triad. Okay, five or five seven. We'll make a determination on that one in a second. But what I wanted to do first is build the third because that's where the trouble is going to come. Our third of this chord is our A sharp. So that's our leading tone. Now, you're probably not going to want to move to this, the soprano to the A sharp because that's going to give you E to A sharp, gives you a nice tritone, and that's one of those melodic intervals that we try very hard to avoid. So soprano to A sharp is not an option. How about alto to A sharp? It seems like it would work, right? G to A sharp. They're right next to each other on the keyboard. They're right next to each other on the stack. We try and have small movements between our, uh, between our voices in a linear way. Why is G to A sharp not a great idea? If you remember when we first started talking about part writing, one of the intervals that we said to avoid was the augmented second in minor. So G is scale degree six in B minor, right? A sharp is sharp seven, our leading tone seven, right? Scale degree six cannot go to leading tone seven. Now you knew that from counterpoint, when we had minor mode counterpoints. As we were preparing for our cadence, that was one of the things we had to look out for in the minor key. You can't approach your leading tone seven from scale degree six because of the augmented second interval. So that means no A sharp in the alto either which means our only option is to put it in the tenor. So there's our A sharp in the tenor. Let's say we want to have a 5-7 for funsies. Looking at what we have left, there's no nice way, really, to get a full 5-7. But what is user-friendly is to keep the E, so keep the seventh in the soprano, and omit the fifth, which is the one note that we can get rid of in a 5-7, right? Or in a seventh chord. That's the one chord member that is expendable, is the fifth. We can omit the fifth and then just take the alto down to F-sharp. So now we have two roots, one-third and one-seventh, which is absolutely okay. And now you're home free. You know how to resolve a 5-7 to 1. So your chordal seventh is a tendency tone. It has to resolve down, so that's going to resolve down by step to the D. Your leading tone, also a tendency tone. I'm going to resolve that up. And your F sharp in the alto is a common tone. So that gives you a nice, complete triad to finish. So there you go. You have successfully... Um, written out your first TPDT progression of the class. Now what I would like you to do is to take a second and or a minute or two and situate yourself in your next progression. So your next one is in G major and you are missing one Roman numeral. I'm gonna have you come up with it yourself but before I send you off to do that Look at what we have going on in the bass. So you've got a tonic triad, followed by mystery chord, followed by a one six. Now we've seen what can go in between those chords, right? With scale degree two in the bass. We also now have a new arsenal of chords with scale degree two in them. So remember, as you're looking at this, you might have a very strong urge to say, scale degree two is in the bass. I'm going to put a two chord there. Perfect. Remember where predominant chords can and cannot go to. 
and look at what comes after that mystery chord and see if a predominant is really the best option there or maybe something else might be better. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to send you off to work out this progression and then come back. We'll check our answers with one another and I'll talk you through any common pitfalls. Okay, let's see what you came up with. Now, let's talk about the mystery chord first. Scale degree two in the bass, it goes to a tonic flavored triad, which means that it cannot be a predominant chord because predominants don't go to tonic. That means your options are, are some flavor of a dominant. I used a 5-4-3. Some of you may have used a 7 diminished 6. Both of those are totally fine. Both are dominant flavor harmonies and they can both go to tonic. So either are great options. Now we're going to talk about what is the really big pain with this progression, which is right there. Now, whenever you have two consecutive Roman numeral numbers, so four to five, one to two, two to three, once you get to theory two, whenever you have consecutive Roman numerals that are in the same position, so 4, 6 to 5, 6, 1, 6 to 2, 6. You have to be so, so careful about parallel fifths and parallel octaves. Your spidey senses should all like start tingling when you see consecutive Roman numerals in the same position because that is a prime spot to have parallel fifths and octaves. So let's look at what we have. I have my 1, 6 voiced with the G and the tenor and the D in the alto. Now, what I'm guessing that some of you might have for this 2-6 is perhaps this voicing, which is the most intuitive thing to do because it, pres it preserves stepwise motion in your inner voices. It gives you a nice, fluffy, full triad with two roots. That is the most intuitive thing to do. However, it also gives you some nice, parallel fifths between your tenor and your alto. So how do we go about avoiding that? There are a couple of options. So what you might have done if you managed to avoid the parallel fifths, what you might have ended up with was actually this voicing. Which honestly, it's two roots and two thirds. It's not anyone's favorite way to voice a triad but you avoided the parallel fifths and that's the big important thing. So if you have that, good job avoiding the parallels and catching that. And that voicing is totally fine. Is it the preferred way to voice a triad? No. But voice leading always, always, always trumps doubling preference. So good job avoiding the parallel fifths. Leave it the way it is. You might also have what I had. Um, I chose to leap in the tenor by a third, so I took a little jump of a third to move down to an E. And that gives me a fully voiced triad. I still moved the alto down to the C. And that gives me a fully voiced triad, my bass is doubled, and I have all of my chord members. Then moving on, I chose to do a 5-7, which means that I actually kept a common tone in the alto. Uh, if you have a C in your alto, in that 2-6, and you move to just a 5 chord, make sure that you did not move your alto up to a D, because that gives you a nice parallel octave right there. I, to be honest, if I'm given the choice 5 or 5-7, five, I'm usually going with a 5-7, because that 7th oftentimes saves you from having a parallel 5th or octave where you might be tempted to put one. So given the option, I'm always going to throw a seventh in there. It tends to make your part writing life a little easier. But it's only easier if you remember to resolve the seventh down. So I have my nice little arrow here, my seventh, which is a tendency tone resolved down, and my scale degree seven, which is also a tendency tone, I did resolve up, which gave me three roots and a third for my final harmony which is just the way the cookie crumbles sometimes when you have scale degree seven in an inner voice. If you are a leading tone frustrator and you had your scale degree seven move down 
to five to fill out your triad for the final cadence, that is fine. That is totally correct. And now that we are moving along further in the semester, um, I trust you to make that decision for yourself. Okay, let's take a look at this checklist and go over it one last time. So forever and always when you're doing part writing, it's always nice to have a little checklist. Make sure your chords have roots and thirds. Very important. And make sure your seventh chord has a seventh because then it's not a seventh chord. In minor, raise your leading tones. I have so many exclamation marks on that. Raise your leading tones in minor. Also in minor, make sure you don't approach sharp seven from six. We saw that in the blue progression up there in B minor. Make sure the leading tone and the seventh of your five seven are not doubled. So that is a doubling rule you can't mess with. Don't double your leading tones. Don't double your sevenths. Make sure the seventh of your five sevens resolves down. We did our little arrows there to make sure of that. Remember that your predominants always appear after tonic, but before the dominant, which is why you couldn't have a predominant harmony here. And last but not least, double check for parallel fifths and octaves, especially when you have consecutive Roman numerals in the same position. Okay. That is your introduction to predominant harmonies. In class on Wednesday, we are going to actually get into like a full chunk of music. So not a little excerpt. We've got a slightly longer score that we're going to look at a piece by Margaret Bonds. Um, and we'll get in there and put some Roman numerals on things. And we now have enough tools to like do some cool analysis. So we're going to jump on in there and we'll talk a little bit more about this idea of harmonic syntax of the order of events and what we should expect and how to kind of construct our analyses around that. All right, wonderful. Thank you guys. I'll see you in class on Wednesday.